I'm doing this. We're doing it. Pulling up the notes. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance. It is weekly scrap number 189. In the grips of death, we depend on our sisters and brothers. Through smoke and fire, we protect each other. Our calling is clear. We shall not wander. When protecting life, it's death before dishonor. And here and now we raise our glass, a toast to the fallen heroes of the past. Tradition, brotherhood, duty forever, for this could be our last drink together. Slancha. 100%. I lead off with that. The official fool's toast because... Our guest tonight is none other than the author of that same toast. It is. It should get interesting tonight, but it is none <laughs> yeah, other. To say the least. Than Maddie Johnson. Uh, Fireman Maddie Johnson has been a student of the fire service since 2007, holds a degree in fire science. He's currently assigned to the operations divisions at Fort Lauderdale Fire Department, attached to the 2nd Battalion Float Company in the confines of downtown Fort Lauderdale. Broward County, Florida, Maddie is also the logistical coordinator for National Rescue Consultants, the leaders of technical rescue training in the U.S. Maddie also enjoys, this is my favorite part of the bio, hardcore and punk rock music and his two pit bulls, Moo and Goonie. It is my absolute pleasure to have you on as the guest of Weekly Scrap number 189. Welcome, my brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Is there anything I missed, anything you would like to add to the intro? Not really. I would like to say that, like, normally um, when I'm on a podcast, I don't really like talking about my department. Um, I just don't sit there and want to act like I, I re really uh, – anything I say could get me in trouble or make them look bad. But I'm so proud of uh, being a Fort Lauderdale firefighter, especially after everything I've been through and the way that the city, the guys upstairs, the body, my brothers on the floor, brothers and sisters on the floor, um, have taken care of me that – I want everybody to know how great that city and that department is. So that's awesome. That's it. Awesome way to rep. Thank you, my brother. Audience, get your questions primed and ready for Maddie and myself. This one, I'm excited, man. <laughs> um, I'm absolutely excited. I'm, I'm trepiditious. That's a word yes. I don't often use. Uh, I'm you not get points for words. Yes, the more cinnamon uh, syllables. <laughs> syllables. <laughs> yeah, the more syllables, the better. Uh, we try, like to impress the truckies, is what I like to say. Yes. Um, Romagus is at FDIC. He's been teaching. He's been getting set up for uh, the hot evolutions and stuff. He may or may not chime in. If he does, great. If he does not, I understand. Um, quick announcements. If you want to be a part of the Vigilantes, uh, if you want to be a member of the exclusive, what I call the Cool Kids Club, go to firehousevigilance.com, sign up for exclusive swag, exclusive discounts, exclusive monthly forums, and now on to the sponsors. The original, the OG, the sponsor of the scrap, it is Key Hose. Check them out on Facebook. They are the hose experts. IDLH Apparel. Stay dangerous, everyone. Check them out at IDLHapparel.com. Affordable Drill Towers. Home of the Affordable Drill Tower and the Affordable Standpipe Prop. Firefighter owned and operated. Pump and roll using the Affordable Standpipe Prop. The Affordable Standpipe Prop fits through most classroom doorways for standpipe theory, and then you can roll it out into the parking lot and pump. It comes with six standpipe valves that can be upgraded to prvs or customized to what you have in your jurisdiction call steve 844-55-TOWER or drop an email to info at affordable drill towers.com and then finally if you are looking to streamline your fire and ems training programs introducing the fire academy schedule deliver and track everything in your organization get the highest rated online training from industry leaders backed by fire engineering FDIC International and Gems. Sign up for your free trial at thefireacademy.com. And with that, all of the housekeeping is out of the way, and we are ready for scrap number 189. Maddie, um, you said it, you, you, I always send an email out and say, What do you want to talk about? You know, et cetera. And you said, I don't want to spend too long on the story. So I want, I, basically, I'm just going to say, I'm going to give you the broad brush to paint the picture and say, go set the stage for the story um, and you control it. All right. Now I, I'm going to, 
I guess, preface this with the fact that as soon as I say this, these couple words, everyone's going to freak out and possibly turn us off because we're firemen. We don't like talking about this shit. And um, I mean, I was 100% the exact same way. And uh, it's, it's, it's very weird. Um, it's an interesting thing for me. Um, you know, one of my buddies was joking around the other day. He said, you went from a mediocre fire instructor to uh, possibly the face of mental health in the fire service. And I said, well, I guess I get, I'll, I'll take that and I'll own it. Right. Um, I, so I'm the, uh, I'm like the, uh, the commander of, um, I guess, fucking up. I'm really, I was really good at it for a long time. So, um, again, like I said, this is a mental health story and, um, it's my journey. It's my story. Um, and I hope that I guess, um, some of the listeners that are here tonight, um, I want everyone to think of this as one of your best friends at the firehouse at the kitchen table. Um, just telling you his side of what it's like. And I guess for me, at least, I just want you guys to to really just take into account how easy, how quick it is to get into a bad spot and how it can spiral out of control, and but how also easy it is to come out of it, or not so much come out of it, but to make the switch and then do the hard work to get back and actually better than you were beforehand, I guess. Um, if you guys haven't heard before, um, again, my name is Maddie Johnson. I work for Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue, the fire department. And uh, I am, or no, well, I, I hate this. And everybody in the group says you have to say you're an alcoholic, but uh, I'm trying to put that shit behind me. Um, uh, I was seriously addicted to alcohol um, and severely, severely depressed. And it almost cost me in my life twice. So I guess that's the easiest way to start it off. Um, I guess home life. And like I said, I want to get through this just so we can start getting to some some points of getting better and where I'm at now. Um, I got really, really depressed. I was, um, you know, I've been on the job. This probably started about, uh, I've been sober for two years now. So let's say about seven years ago, um, drinking and really taking control of my life because I wasn't getting, I guess I was afraid to admit I was lying to myself about the fact that there was something wrong inside my head. Um, and I refused even though I had 99% of the signs of depression and everything else, I refused that that was my issue. And I know that we also have a problem in the fire hurt service thinking that we're special. And again, I hate saying that about everybody, but I know I did. And I felt like, oh no, you know, these things don't affect me. I'm, I'm better than that, but they're really starting to get to me. And I was having a serious, serious issue um, with drinking when I was off work. And um, it consumed my life. Um, and yeah, like I said, um, the isolation started um, as soon as I got off work, I had to have a drink and, um, it got to the point where I knew I had to stop, but I was incapable of it. I wasn't having fun drinking anymore, but if I stopped, I was detoxing. Sure. Um, I was told numerous. I want to, I want to, I want to ask, cause it's something that I know a lot of people have asked me and struggled with is what, was it a psychological or a physical addiction at first? Or, or can you even, can you even articulate that? Is that, does my question make sense? Yeah, of course. Um. I think I started, I enjoyed, uh, obviously, I mean, I like, um, I grew up in a house where drinking was very regular. Um, you, know, you know, Irish parents, it was just like normal. It was nothing, it wasn't, it was an everyday occurrence. Um, and it was really just a celebration thing. I mean, we did it. Um, and I, I say we, I said, I did it just like, oh, I'd like to say the majority of my friends, it was like um, birthday parties, promotions, right. funerals, you know, all the get togethers with the boys. And it was, it was great until I stopped enjoying it and I started leaning on it to deal with um, obviously my mental health issues. So yeah. I think I had a pretty good, uh, I hate to say handle, um, but I was drinking to have fun beforehand or like just, you know, socially. And right. then yeah. um, when the, the mental health issue happened, it turned into a serious, serious problem where I was using alcohol as like, I guess, like a medicine. No, no, hundred percent. Now, was it an acute issue or was it a chronic uh, as far oh, as oh no, it was definitely chronic, and I feel like um I I, I had a drinking. Pro I mean, when you drink four or five days out of the week, and you're only like not having a beer when you're on shift, I mean you've you've got to just like when it starts getting away of like your everyday and responsibilities and stuff like that, it turns into a problem. Um, I think I definitely again that that time where I feel like I was starting to notice I had a problem. I was lying to myself for so long. I'm not really sure where it started. Sure, sure, very gray. Mm -hmm. But I definitely say like, um, I said right in the beginning of my career, I had a, um, a serious problem with drinking. 
um, but it wasn't, it was for a different, I guess, a different reason. Um, again, uh, uh, I had a lot, we had a lot of, uh, it was crazy. Um, and I feel like it just happened. And I, I don't remember this going on as much when I first got hired, but while I was going through my own issues, there was a lot of, um, suicide and, um, it really hit the forefront with me. I had a couple of my friends that weren't the fire service and then guys that were on the department that just decided they had had enough and were, and were killing themselves. Uh, and I guess I began having a problem or I, I had an issue with, I guess, like expressing or actually grieving, I guess the grieving process for me, like I skipped it and, um, everything regardless it, it's just like drinking was a part of every facet so if there was a celebration i was having a cocktail if there was a funeral i was having a cocktail if i was going through a tough time i was having a drink and i think it all spawned from the fact that drinking used to be a really really fun thing for me and then when i was dealing with depression i was like well i know drinking is gonna make me feel good so let me jump back into that right um so like i said i was doing the we have the department physicals and they told me that I like had a fatty liver and this was like progressing and I just like completely ignored it. It got to the point where I was on shift one day and I'd lost a ton of weight. Um, I went from being that guy that was at the kitchen table goofing off um, first, you know, doing station duties, having a great time, laughing about calls, not bitching to a guy that was in his room. The tones would go off and I'd come out and I'd be like, what the fuck? Why are we going on this? This is bullshit. Um, I was distancing myself from people and um i started noticing a change like i got dramatic weight loss i started noticing some yellowing in my eyes and i again i'd find one thing in the list of what makes you an alcoholic or liver issues that i didn't have and i'd run with it and be like oh it's not me um ran a call late woke up in the morning said i wanted to take a shower i was feeling off i felt like something i had eaten when i ate it was barely anything so that was impossible and i started throwing up blood in the shower um, I ran and I ran out and up to the, uh, the captain's room and I banged on the door and I said, Hey, listen, I need the rescue to take me to the hospital. And you think that would have been enough for me to stop. Um, got to the hospital, embarrassing. I had the crew at our station, take me to the hospital, all the, the nurses and stuff that I knew in the hospital were there. And, uh, I was throwing up blood damn near on my deathbed. Uh, they did an endoscopy. Um, and I had some ablations done because I had esophageal varices at the time. And, uh, Spent some time in the hospital, got out, and didn't go get mental help, didn't do anything, refused to believe I had a problem. Just Full steam like, ahead? Yeah, I mean, I was so sick at that time in my head that, like, I attributed it because I sang in a hardcore band for a long time, and I was just like, oh, it's because my throat and my vocal cords is from screaming for years and all this shit. It was such bullshit. And um, I kept drinking. I acted like everything was, you know, like, I was just like, I, I did the the exact same thing that I, a lot of people do after reading about it. Oh, well, y'all have a glass of wine with dinner or I'm, I'm not going to drink hard liquor anymore. I only have a beer. I'll have light beer. And then you slowly just get back into the rhythm of boozing again, boozing hard. So about a month after that happened, I was heavy drinking again and I was at home and I started throwing up blood again, heavy, turned pale white, was on the floor and I, got to my phone, thank God. And I was able to call um, one of my best friends is a captain of our department, Joe Fox. And I was like, Hey man, like I'm, I think I'm dying. And he had um, rescue Palm Beach County rescue showed up, picked me up from the house, got to the hospital and went through the exact same ordeal again. I was mm -hmm. off. And um, this time um, I went to go get treatment for the first time. And uh, I went for the wrong reasons. Um, my uh, relationship was, was in the gutter because I was just so selfish and, so involved in the alcohol portion of my life um you know obviously work had suffered um i wasn't making rational decisions at work like you know like the, i i definitely crossed that line from being a huge asset at work to that 100 percent liability wow and yeah. and it's hard and it's hard obviously you know for a company officer because like i am one of the guys i'm one of the boys i was always happy i was always doing these things and it's a very very hard decision when you're like man should i take this guy off the truck do i need to like do something about this no no you put him in that position because you were such an asset of course so he, so he wants to protect you and now you're it's like he's betraying that asset 
and it's it, I'm, and now looking back at it, it was selfish to like put anyone in that predicament because number one, you don't want to want me to like blow up and do something stupid. Sure. It's, it's a very hard line to tread across. And, and something no one, no one is, is prepared for in this job to deal with that issue. And I'd like to ask the question. This is, and this is, I guess, to the audience as well, is like, are you willing to ask that question and get a truthful response? Because that's, that's, that's the down and gritty. You're so, we're so, um, I guess, used to getting the, Hey man, are you good? Yeah, bro. Right. I'm good, man. I'm okay. I'm fine. I learned out afterwards in my progression in mental health and, you know, telling my story and trying to help people that it's a very different story when you all of a sudden ask a question like that, or you receive a phone call at two or three o'clock in the morning and you're like, Hey man, I've got a gun in my mouth. I don't know what I'm going to do right now. Or you're at work and someone looks at you as the boss. You're like, no, I'm not good. I'm not fucking okay. I don't, I, my, my marriage is in shambles. Um, I'm about to lose the house. Um, they recode my boat. Like all of these things happen. And now you're like, shit how do I answer this? How do I go about that? So again, it was very selfish. And I did put a lot of my bosses, my coworkers, my partners, like all in this just mess of this thing that I created for myself. And again, this is, you, you have to own that in recovery. This isn't anybody else's fault. This is hundred percent me. At the time I didn't see it that way. Right. So right. again, the exact same thing happened. I got, went to the hospital. So I go to treatment for the first time. And like I said, when you get there, and this is interesting, everyone says, listen, you need to go there for yourself. Alcoholism and addiction and mental health is a very selfish thing in itself because you have to fix yourself before you can fix any other facet in your life. You're no good to anyone else half good. And I definitely did not at all go to get into this as that was my goal. I was trying to fix a relationship. I was trying to get back to work. I was itching to get back on the truck because i had been off it so long and i wasn't really doing the work that's involved with right it. right so you do something half ass. what happens i get out mm -hmm. i go back to work the world doesn't change when you're in this bubble of rehabilitation and i was in a first responder program that was amazing i just didn't take advantage of it got out and more bad news broke my sobriety after a month started hitting it hard again and at this point i had become um, and then this, I mean, I hate saying this now and it sucks, but I was just like, okay with dying. Um, you know, I'd sit there, I went through the entire thing, staring at my gun. Um, I joked around about this. Um, and I've never told this to anybody before. I've never spoke about it. Um, I kept when EJ Mascaro passed away, um, Jimmy Meyer, um, one of the, the rounds that they fired off at the salute at his funeral. Um, he gave me one of the casings when I was standing there in Erie, Pennsylvania, and it was snowing. And I remember looking down at this thing and I was crushed that, you know, one of my best buds had passed away. And I used to carry that casing around with me. And I had it in my pocket all the time. And then when this all started happening and I was just really just in this spate where I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Like, and I had never really understood how someone could be suicidal or how someone could be depressed because it was, a, it was something so foreign to my mindset being a happy person and that I didn't think it was possible. Right. And then it was funny. Um, I had a 38 special and uh, that was a gun that I was planning on killing myself with. And uh, you know, I had this round and uh, you know, I looked at it all the time and it was just in my room and we just float around like the table and shit like that. And then finally that round ended up in my pocket and it sat there and I used to, in my head, I was just like, you know, Sal, how crazy is this is the you know the round when EJ's funeral is now sitting there making noise in my pocket. A little while after that, I sat there and I took that round and it got a new home, got out of my pocket, and I put it in my 38 and I put it in my drawer and I was just itching by it. Someone came up to me and told me because they knew I was in a bad place, and there was at this point like I'd given up on everything. They were like, you know, you're gonna hurt a lot of people, you're not trying to get help if you do what I think you're gonna do. And at that point, the only thing I could think of is like, you know what, you're right. I can't put my parents through that, but I'm already a disappointment. Everyone knows I'm an alcoholic. So if I drink myself to death, there's not going to be an issue. So I just extended it. I did like a, a weird slow death approach, knowing that my uh, health was in the shitter. And I just kept drinking and drinking and drinking, hopefully hoping one day I wasn't going to wake up. And um, I ended up getting off shift. Um, went to New Jersey 
And I, I mean, at this point, like I was skin and bone and um, I went to New Jersey to go visit my aunt who was in hospice. And uh, I ended up having the exact same thing happen, but just to a bigger degree. I was in the hospital, started throwing up blood and yeah, uh, rushed to the hospital, um, completely started bleeding out. Thank God they got me to the hospital when they did. They did a stopgap procedure. Um, I ended up giving numerous um, blood transfusions, hands on the chest, the entire thing. Um, I ended up getting flown to another hospital and from the other hospital, flown back down to Florida. And I had what's done, what's called a TIPS procedure, um, which helps with portal hypertension. And it's a lot of nonsense. It doesn't matter at this point, but it's, it's not a fixing. It's not a fixing to the problem I have. My liver was shot and they just gave me a little bit of extra time. I feel like this is a lot to fucking process. Um, <laughs> so I hope everyone's still listening. I hope you enjoy. Uh, I'm, I'm laughing, but I'm not. I mean, it's just, yeah, because you're laughing, but go ahead. Yeah, I can laugh now. And that's right. fucking amazing. And I'm going to get into that. And I, I can laugh about this now. And it's not a laughing matter, but it it's just, uh, it was that road. It was that fucked up road that I decided to take. And now like I've, you know, exited off of it, you know, continued on my path. So, and I'm glad that I can laugh now. Um, so after that all happened, got out, uh, I was in the hospital forever, had to learn how to eat, um, shit, walk, talk. I was innovated for a very long time. Um, all that stuff over again. And when you become incapacitated like that, um, your whole, I had a hard reset, I guess. And I was just like, wow, you know, like, I, how was I living like this? I can't believe this. I had phone calls. I had people come visit me. And, and I was just like, wow, you know, people really do care. I wasn't by myself. But at the same time, I didn't feel like I could stay sober. Um, I was just like, I, at this point, I had failed myself. And I was still like, kind of in a rut. And I was like, this is impossible to get out of. Right. So when the doctors came in, and they told me, and this is a really fucking weird story. But this guy kind of spared me straight. This doctor came in and he was looking at me and he's like, you got beautiful eyes. And I was just like, all right, that's, that's a, weird. That's a weird start. Yeah. <laughs> I go, that's yeah. super weird, man. Like, I don't know where this is going. I, and I can't run from this guy either. And he was bigger than me. So I was getting kind of concerned. But thank and you. He, yeah. And he goes, you know, when you have another drink again or you don't get this fixed, I'm going to, we're going to harvest your cornea since you're an organ donor. And I was just like, holy shit. Right. A little while later, you know, I started regaining everything and pushed myself real, real hard in the rehabilitation center. Um, and the, the nurses, the staff at um, Broward Gym were amazing, amazing. And, um, you know, got strong again and got out of there. When I was leaving the hospital, you know, the doctors came in and the, the, I was meeting with the transplant team continuously. And they finally told me, they were like, listen, you need to get on the list because the procedure that we did only lasts a year and a half. And I said, okay. And, you know, like I had a night to think about it. And I couldn't at this point because I was finally getting kind of clear headed. I was off booze for a long time. And I was, you know, my head was feeling like myself and that empathy that I had lost along the way um, was kind of like inside of me again. I guess it's the easiest way to put it. And I couldn't, after doing this job for so long and being somebody who cared about life and other people's life, like it was foreign. It was outside of my perspective to be, to take an organ from someone if I couldn't fucking stay sober. So I opted out. I said, no, I'm not going to go. And I didn't tell anybody about it. Mm. My parents didn't even know, but I had a one-on-one -on -one with the doctor and I said, you know, like, I'm not going to go through this because I, I don't feel right about it because I know myself and I know I'm going to drink again. Well, um, you know, like I said, went back to light duty, got to work and all of a sudden, you know, things started looking up. It was crazy. I wasn't, I didn't think I could stay sober, but I kind of made this thing inside my head where, you know, like I'm going to test myself. I'm going to see how long I can get this going. And then, you know, like I'll fall off and then it'll just be like it was and I'll die this time and that'll be the end of it. And, you know, like everybody's going to, and I always had this in my vision, you know, everyone's already like counted against me. And uh, you were okay with it like that, like you had accepted it or was it subconscious? I had accepted at this point that I was going to die. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I mean, once I had had like, why? Well, come to the grips of the fact that I wanted to kill myself at this point, at least I was, you know, going to go out and I was in, again, you know, still not right in the head, but I didn't honestly think that I could stay sober. So going, putting, taking, all I could think about was like taking a liver out of like someone who had like, um, 
a, a disease that really, really needed it. And right. They no, no, dying complete justification for what you're doing. Uh, let me ask you this, man, and uh, because I, I, it really fascinates me, and I hope that it doesn't come across as morbid. No, uh, no, no. Because you you made the decision that you weren't going to like eat a bullet, but you were going to kill yourself. You know, more. What what do you want to call it? More. Uh, not naturally, it's not the right term, but like more. What's the, what's the term for it? Because I don't know. Because the, the mindset almost had to be the same. Yes. I mean, again, it's still. I'm still doing. Yeah, it is. A hundred and fifty percent. It. Yeah, it was. And I, it, when you talk about, it's funny that you said like the the morbidity aspect of it. It's like I used to think like, and I've always been obsessed with stalls. I don't know if it was the music and I like horror movies and all that shit. Right on. But and I I don't want to forget about this, so I'm just gonna say it. We can we can revisit it. We had it wrong forgetting about this because a long time ago the, the cab like all of that stuff was very very prevalent whether it was in the church and all that stuff and it was just a reminder that memento mori mentality we are going to die there's nothing we can do about it we are going to die and uh it's actually really 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 beautiful because it makes you so and i and i started to experience this so grateful for the time that we have and it makes you really want to get get as much out of this life that we have because we are going to meet that end eventually Yes. So I really dig the whole skulls and remembering that you're going to die because it's like, fuck, I'm going to die. I really want to go out and do this. Or, you know, um, you know, you know I'm going to sleep in today. No, fuck that. I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to experience the sun's of sunrise. Something. Yes. I mean, it's different for everybody. But anyway, when I got back to work um, and I had a different mindset and I was putting in the work of mental health, I was like, fuck, man, I don't I don't know if I want to die anymore. But I knew I had a time limit. I knew it was going to run out, and I wasn't going to visit the doctor. It was crazy. I had a, I became like a doctor over that year. I read up on all the medications I was originally prescribed when this happened, and I kind of sat there and medicated myself. And I, my diet, because my liver wasn't working, like my diet was so important, and the pills. I again through that year. And, you know, doing the work with mental health and everything, I fell in love with being alive again. And for so long, it was insane that, you know, the only thing that was on my head and in my, uh, my mind was I wanted to be dead with my friends for so long. I was mourning all this loss. and I had all this pent up depression. And in that year, I went from wanting to be dead with my friends to wanting to be alive for them. Because whatever happened when that tra tragic incident that I put myself through, that tragic years of just really being depressed and where I was at now, I found a way to get better and fix my mind. And now I knew I was like, fuck, man, I really, I got to start telling people right. that if I would have heard this from someone like me that was, I guess, and it's different because like so, like a relatable per I don't want to say that I'm fucking relatable because that's it's not the case but I'm just saying like in a different approach I think I could have grasped it and I don't know if I could have but that's like where I found myself in that year was finding myself like yo I gotta fucking tell somebody about this it was like imagine like finding like the best drink in the world or the best fucking food it's like or salt or pepper for the first I'm like hey man I gotta fucking tell everybody about this yeah, shit this like, is I found awesome it. this is mad this is fucking magic. And um, it was amazing. As sick as I fucking was, my head was perfect for the first time in my life. Now, was, so was I there a, I, 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 I'm digging. I'm just digging. Was there a moment? Was it a, a, was it a, a, was it a chronic process that got you there? Was there an epiphany? I put in work? Yeah. In my entire fucking life, when it became to depression, it was so fucking easy for me to be like, Man, you know what? Fuck it. I'm depressed. That's it. There's something wrong in my head. That's it. But not once, not fucking once, did I try to be happy. Ever. Ever. I did not put the work in. Do you know like when you're doing a scenario or forget a scenario. Let's do it this way. If I fucked up my arm and I injured my elbow, they put a cast on it, right? That's the beginning process of the healing process. Wow, fuck. My arm hurts. What am I going to do? Fix it. I'm going to put a cast on it. After the cast right. gets cut off, you know, I'm going to sit there. I'm going to go to PT. Then I'm going to do weight. And I'm going to continually ice it. I'm going to nurture it until this thing is fucking strong and stronger than it was before. When it comes to mental health, we don't do any of the rehab 
process because we fucking lie to ourselves and we don't admit, or me at least, that I had a fucking problem to start working on to fix. Mm. It's so easy to fucking sit there and say that you're depressed when you're not doing anything about getting better. It's simple. It's that comfort space. It's that isolation. It's, oh, well, I'm going to be depressed. Ah, it's over here. Because I know that getting better means I've got to sit there, I've got to go to a meeting, or I've got to sit there and I've got to talk to my therapist. I've got to pull myself outside. Mm. You know, I have to go out and do things. I can do new things. I have to exercise. And for the first time in my life, my mind was where it needed to be, and my body was starting to lag. It was never, I never had an equal balance of it. My body was all here, and I was fucking all about boozing and being depressed. And then all of a sudden, I had this switch. I had this epiphany and death experience happen. And now my mind was perfect for the first time. And now my body's failing and dying. Right. It was really, it was really weird. And then it was too late. You know, I well, I found all this stuff. I started really getting involved with helping other people and telling my story. I was yellow beyond belief. Um, and this is interesting. And I love telling this um, because I hope this hits close to the, um, the firehouse hearts here. There's nothing better than recovery about anything than being in the firehouse and having your homies bust your balls it is the best it was the best because if i was sick i was dying and it was obvious and if these guys would have let off on the fact that i was yellow it would have made me feel worse at work because they weren't acting natural with me i loved every minute of getting my balls busted at work from everything man they were calling me maddie simpson uh maddie jaundice it was great i needed that because I would have done it to somebody else just to show that love because you need that, that like inclusiveness in that tribe setting. Like I, we know what's going on, but we're going to fucking sit here and bust your balls and treat you just like you, you need, like we've right. always done. There was no, there was no mix up. And that was huge for me. And no one knew, and no one knew I was really dying because I kept lying and saying I was going to have another procedure done. And, um, so it was interesting when I had to finally tell everybody, Hey guys, you know, like I'm going into the hospice. Everyone was like, Holy shit. Um, but yeah, but then it was too late. And I was like, Oh my God it's a year it's a year and six seven months and i'm fucking still sober because i put the work in i got happy again like for the first time in my life i tried i fucking i took that algorithm that everyone's been preaching forever and i made it my own i didn't do exactly what everyone said but i sat there and i took the groundwork i built up on it and i made it work for me and lo and behold a year and eight months later, the guy who fucking tried to kill himself with alcohol hasn't had a drink. Mind is perfect. I got that empathy back. I got that passion back. I got that love for the job back. I got all of those things because I decided I'm going to make a change. And it was a light switch. Okay, this is what I'm doing. And that's it. And I fucking went down the path, made it my own. And here we are. But now I'm dying. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no shit. So I'm in, I'm in the, the, the room and I remember being there and Dr. Roach, God bless this man, um, worked at Cleveland Clinic. This man's had my back and he's been through, he was through the ringer with me. This guy took me off the airplane when I was medevaced back down to, my, um, to Fort Lauderdale and he stuck with me through the entire escapade. And uh, he told me to hold on, just like, you know, don't give up hope and all this stuff. And I ended up, uh, the liver transplant team came and told me, they were like, listen, you haven't been to the doctor. You have none of the tests done. You have to be medically cleared. You have to be psychologically cleared. Um, you need all these tests. And usually it takes a healthy person a month. They're like, you're on your deathbed. Um, we don't know how you're alive. Um, you should have been unconscious. My ammonia levels were so high at this point. My sodium was so low that they said I should have been unconscious a month and a half prior. Damn. Um, I should have been hallucinating. And that's, and that's another thing, man, your, your mind is so strong. It's fucking crazy. And I would have never believed it unless this happened and hearing this from fucking professionals, but they ended up trying to take me on and I had to pass these tests in four days and I ended up getting through them. It fucking almost killed me. Um, I got rushed into the ICU a whole bunch of times while this was all going on. And I, uh, they told me they had, they met and they had their little coven meeting where they put their robes on. They fucking stand there with their survivor fire. And they decide whether or not like I'm good enough to be a candidate for a liver transplant. And I make the list and they came back in and um, I remember my mom was in the room and they came back in and they said, Hey, you know, uh, you're on the list. Now you just can't die before you get one. Right. And I was like, and you know, all I've heard is stories about people dying on the list. Right. But what's crazy. And this is going to sound really fucked up as much as I want to, I wanted to live. I was so grateful for that last year where my mind got better 
and I, I got all of those things that I had been missing for so long Ooh. back. And I was just like, well, you know what? Like, I want this. I'm going to keep fighting. But man, the just the the overwhelming just humility and gratefulness that I was able to experience that one year of had, building up relationships with my friends and shit again and running the calls, and fighting fires, and getting out of a fire after fucking six hours and getting in the back of the truck and lying to everybody because I'm so dehydrated and cramped up and because my liver's not working. I can't process everything and still being happy about it. And um, I got a phone call at 12 o'clock, two days later in the morning. I was watching, I forget what I was watching. I was watching some comedy. And uh, this woman starts talking to me. I'm not paying attention. I was back doing my art again. I got back into drawing and burning and all this stuff, and painting. And uh, she calls me and she's like, did you listen to anything I just said? And I said, no. And she goes, we found a liver for you. And we'd like to know if you could accept it. And my heart stopped. And I was just like, what? And, she, and I was, and I told her I was, I, I, I guess I came off like a smart ass, but I, I was so overwhelmed. I was like, I don't know how this works. Do so like, do I shop around? Do I take the first one? You know, what do I do? <laughs> and she's like, listen, I can't tell you what to do, but I want you to open your heart and I want you to listen to me. And I want you to listen to what I'm saying right now. We found a, a match. And we're really excited about it. And I said, well, great. 16 hours later, I was opened up. I had a really, really rough surgery. I think it took 13 hours. Um, there were some sketchy times in it. Um, and I woke up a day and a half later. And here I am. Wow. So we're uh, seven months post-transplant now. And uh, I just got done uh, doing a six-mile ruck um circuit workout and it's in may 2nd i go back to light duty and i'm going to be back on the job and then hopefully september will be a year and uh hopefully be in the back of that engine so that's it and um it's amazing yeah so. yeah brother i said paint it with a very broad brush. that's the first question that was the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not it's a, a weird trip it's uh it's definitely but um it's, it's, it's been amazing. It's, um, and now, um, everything I've been doing with this whole six feet over and being able to talk and, you know, going and talking at addiction clinics and, um, you know, talking to, to vets and firemen and getting those phone calls at night now, just, it's, it's been a hundred percent like a, a blessing. It's, um, I've got, you know, besides the fire service and everything else, I was, I, I've got a new purpose and, um, I love sharing it. And um, letting people know that it's 100% possible. Getting getting better, getting out of that funk, getting out of that that fucked up spot and really getting your life back on track Hell from yeah. death and suicidal ideations and just everything. Let me, let me just say this. I, I, and I wanna, I'm gonna, I've got a lot of people watching right now. and But there's been – everybody's just listening, I'm guessing, because there's been no comments coming at you, no questions coming at you. And I know because it, it is the – it is the topic. Don't get me wrong, man. Like there is, especially when you say stuff like, Hey, if you're drinking, I was drinking for, if I wasn't on duty, I was drinking. And then everybody in the audience is like, Oh shit. You know, with that being said, I, towards the end, I was drinking in fucking serious excess. And again, and this is where I guess I stray away from a lot of the pack and the mental health people. And even a lot of guys in the service that talk about this, I am not anti fucking alcohol. I'm not anti like doing anything. Um, I got a lot of flack from psychiatrists and shit when I was going on my path about this because they wanted me to stop hanging out with people that drank. They needed like I needed to be in this like weird fucking club of sober people that just wanted to sit there and be sober together and, and do all this stuff. The, and I'm going to be 100% honest. The reason I think that a lot of if you're trying to get sober and that's your mission, that shit doesn't work is because you start doing all of that at once. And if you're telling me, okay, I have to stop something that I'm doing on the daily that makes that in my head makes me happy and I drink all the time. And now I can't hang out with my friends. I can't do the shit that I'm used to go doing. I can't do any of this. Of course, it's going to be fucking sad. Sobriety does not mean mentally healthy. And if you're drinking too much and that's your fucking issue, then you've got a mental health problem also. And it's just that simple. And you can't quit everything at once. It's impossible. So I didn't want to make new friends. I didn't want to do anything. All I did was say, okay, well, I'm not going to fucking drink. I can't drink. And I had to learn how to have fun not drinking again. But it, it's fucking possible. But you can't sit there and change your entire life because of one thing. I use this analogy, and I know Rob loves this. Um, 
if I, my entire life, I fucking loved gumbo. And I was just in Louisiana and I got to have some. It was amazing. But I was with Rob. And um, we were at the Louisiana Fire Training Conference. And I love this analogy because I was thinking about this. And I got to sit there and do this in front of him. So I had a bowl of gumbo and I'm sitting there and I was like, and he's always like mystified that I can go out and I can go to these training events. I can go hang out with boys and we can, they can be partying like crazy. And I'm having my liquid death. I said, if I fucking love gumbo and all of a sudden I developed this weird fucking seafood allergy, I'm not going to, and I can't have shrimp in the gumbo anymore. There's not a chance in hell I'm not going to eat gumbo anymore. I'm going to take the shrimp out and that's going to be the end of it. And I'm, it's not going to taste the same, but I'm going to learn to love chicken gumbo and i'm gonna add more sausage into it and i'm gonna make that work for me right and that's exactly what i did with this and it's it's got to be your own brand there's framework there's obviously ground rules that you got to fucking sit there and hit but once you get those make it your own make your recovery your own thing because there isn't one set this this isn't I, i i don't know how to put this like there isn't i guess um one way to 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 make a gumbo, I say, let's say that. It's crazy. You got to make everything your own. It's got to taste good to you. You got to want to eat it. So. I love it. You ready for the first question coming at you from the audience? Let's hear. It's from a guy we know named Robert Ramirez. He wants to know, Maddie, how do you feel about the cookie cutter fire service approach to mental health and addiction, such as peer support, CISM, et cetera? Um, all right. Again, I think that there are some flaws. Um, the one thing I want to say about this is we've done it at the mental health in the fire service and in the military. It is grown like crazy, but we still we have to work on, I think, um, peer support for me, especially person, I was going to shit. I had a very, very hard time opening up about it. And I, in fact, I didn't. Um, the reason being, if I, and this is where my issue with peer support came in and why it didn't work for me. And I'm not knocking any of this. Again, everything has to be your own way. But if I'm not going to open up to you, Coral, you're my best friend. If I'm not going to sit there and be like, dude, I'm fucking struggling, dude. My fucking life's in shambles. I'm drinking way too much. I fucking want to kill myself. The last thing I'm going to do is pick up this phone and fucking call a number talk about to talk to somebody on my fire department who maybe I know, maybe I don't know and get on the phone and be like, and give and divulge these inner secrets that I'm already having a hard time working over in my head. And then, you know, giving to, or, and then talking about general, especially to someone that I know who could possibly be on a promotional board, who's going to sit there and second guess my decision-making now because he knows this deep, dark secret about me. So it was a very, that was something that I struggled with. Right. And I think that's very relevant with a lot of people it's like do i think peer support could work talking to other people yeah 100 percent. i mean that's almost like having a psychiatrist but there also comes a point where i think personally we need vetted medically like seriously um psychiatrically trained people that are having these tough conversations with people they can be guys that were on the line that were frontline people the fact i mean the psychiatrist that i talk to now is an ex-vet who did a lot of time in um in combat zones right because relatable and it's people i could talk to but he's also gone to school for four years you don't want to give someone bad advice that's why i try not to like sit there and be like this is what you have to do because it's not this is my story this is what worked for me and if you can vibe with it and you can fuck with it then i like it but i feel like sitting there and having people that aren't trained that go to 40 hour classes and stuff like that giving help or even trying to put me into where I need to go, it runs into a lot of problems and it didn't work for me. Again, it could work for a lot of people, but I'm not really sure. Right. No, no. And it's a struggle. It's a, uh, without a doubt. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to put peer support on blast. And I know that's not what you're doing at all. No, no, definitely but, not. But in your experience, I get the point you're saying is like, I don't want to talk to somebody I know, especially. No. I almost, I almost wonder if it wouldn't be better to have like an auto aid or mutual aid type peer support, you know, or, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's a great, it's a I, great question. And it like, again, and I have like serious problems with the, the way that we do things. And I've talked to other people um, about this also. And again, it, this is going to be a trial and error thing. The issue is that we're fucking trialing and erring with fucking people's mental health, which is an issue, but there is no way to get to it without, you know, doing this. Right. Like, um, 
for instance, I know like after um, Irma and like guys that were on deployments and stuff like that, or even after bad calls, like I can, I'm going to speak from personal experience here. After I run a call where there's dead children or something like that, and I'm forced to go to another firehouse to talk to people that have come from all over the place. In theory, I understand why it's a good idea, but I know personally for me, sitting there and being forced to talk about shit or even like sit in that setting after while I've got blood from another human or a pediatric on me or coming after a fire or making a grab with a dead person. It's like the last thing I want to do is be forced to sit there and talk to somebody and or in like this weird like kind of like group setting. I, and this is again a personal preference, but this needs to be addressed because I think everybody should share this experience about how they feel about this instead of just being like, this is what we're going to fucking do. And that'd be the end of it. Um, uh, I uh, personally, for me, like I honestly loved coming back to the firehouse, having the guys that were on the call, sit there around the table and us just sit there and vibe off each other and talk about the instance. And if we need to go home or we need to go out and do things like with each other, like, I think that's amazing. Like the, the opportunity that we're given to possibly go home or if we want to speak to somebody, um, we had a, I had a bad call and we had a battalion chief that was on, that was on the call with us. And we had like nine trucks that were on it. And we got to the hospital after transporting, like, I can't even tell you how many pediatrics. And uh, they brought us in a room afterwards. We had a discussion and I was so impressed with um, the way that Chief Pingle carried himself and handled that situation, that that's all I needed. Well, we leave and we're going back to the house to get back. There's no trucks at the station. And they're like, you need to go to another station and do a debrief. And I was just like, I was furious. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? My bunker pants, I got blood on me. We, we go, we sit down and I didn't want to hear what anyone had to say. I wanted to go sit with the guys I was on my call. I wanted to cry. I wanted to sit at a table. And um, if we needed something that we were going to call and ask for it, being forced to do something, I think that's, that's kind of what turns people off mm -hmm. is this. I don't want to be told what to do when it's hard enough, like admitting that we need to talk about something. It, it almost seems like I have to go do training. Like if someone calls you like, hey, you didn't do your target solutions. That's what it felt like to me. Mm. No, no. And it's such a, and no one talks about this. No one. Because no uh, one wants to shit on peer support or anything. Right. Or it's, yeah, it's Absolutely. I'm, that's Absolutely. not what I'm trying to do. I'm just sharing my personal experience about it. No, because I've heard this over and over and over from what, whether it be our tornado and Plaza Towers and the kids and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I've heard this. I don't want to talk about it right now. And it's consistent. It's like, you don't, they don't go, no one goes home. It's like you got a month of pictures and dogs at the station, and it's like I, I understand. Like, and again, I'm just talking on my own personal experience. Sure. And I don't. Again, I we're not, yeah. Your point isn't to shit on, like, in your words, shit on yeah. peer support. That's not your point. Your point is let's examine what we're doing and seeing. And that's what we working. need to. We need more of this. And this is what's fucked up about mental health. No one wants to talk about it, but it needs to be talked about. <laughs> These hard conversations have to be fucking talked about because they're. I mean. Again, if more people are talking about this, we're going to come to an accord where we have like a, a, a very like a, a way of different options that we can go when we head when we run into these problems. But I know I'm I'm speaking personally about my friends and guys that have gone on deployment. We've had these tough conversations, which is amazing. And again, I think that what's crazy is we were teaching at a conference not too long ago, and there were three 25, 30 year old guys sitting with me, and they were all telling stories about mental health shit while we're running evolutions. And I was just like. And I was there like in a logistics capacity, but it was just amazing. I looked at everybody and I was like, hey guys, you know, we're at a fire conference right now and you guys are all talking about uh, mental health. And everyone's like, oh, no, yeah, yeah, bullshit. Nah. But it's great. I, I love the fact that this is being talked about because if we fucking care about our people, then we need to care about our people. And this is one of those steps that we need to fucking start talking about. No, without a doubt, man. Uh, suicide claims more than, than anything on the fire ground. And without a doubt, we have to address it. Um, and that and, and it just means having an honest conversation. It's not that, that that is not to say that we're putting anything on trial. We're not saying it's done bad. You're not saying it's done bad. No. It's saying let's have the conversation, man. And it needs to be had over and over and over. You sent me a list of topics, man. One of my and you've talked about it already. Suicide ideation. Um, this is so fucking tough to talk about. I mean, it used to be now, like, I don't give a fuck. The, like, listen, after everything that happened to me, the, the, I'd say a lot of like the reason I never seek mental health. And this is me personally was fucking ego. I was afraid of what I was going to look like after this. And I, ego drives so much 
so many issues in our line of business and everyday life. What was crazy, and this is just a funny story, and I hate to go off topic, but just to lighten the mood a little bit. Yeah. Um, again, like I said, I love hardcore music. I love punk rock, right? Deep down, I still like really, I, I like some, I guess, girly music would be the fucking easiest way to put it. And so you know, I, I'm so intrigued right now by this thing. Yeah, right. Because so I, my producer Sam will tell you how much girly music I like, but go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, after, you know, everything happened and I started doing the work and I was like, you know, I really need to practice this. I'm trying to shut down that ego button and caring what people think and really live in my own truth, right? My own life. For years, for years, I always drive my windows down. I'd be driving and like someone would pull up or there'd be a hot chick or, you know, whatever it was. And someone's going to get up next to me. I fucking blast something hard or, you know, like I put on a good song or something like that. You know, I turn and look and act all hard and tough, stupid mustache, gold teeth, tattoos, right? Sometimes when I'm in the car, you know, I'm not listening to that shit. And, you know, I had, I, I fucking hate that. I'm going to say this. Well, I fucking love Cindy Lauper. Girls just want to have fun. It's one of my favorite songs. <laughs> I feel like it's so, it's so much good energy. I love the 80s. Hey, hey, dude, I, I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. And uh, so I'm driving, I'm fucking singing to Cindy Lauper, right? And I come up to a stoplight. And all of a sudden, I see this fucking Mercedes pulling up. It's fucking got, it's got rims, the fucking music's playing. I'm like, fuck, dude. And I can kind of see the guy coming up. I go, oh, man. And I go to fucking switch the goddamn dial on the radio. And I'm like, wait a second. No, we're working on this. Fuck that. You like this song, we're going to leave it on. And we're going to see how this goes. And I'm nervous. I am nervous. Sure as shit. This car pulls up next to me. Dude's been to prison a couple times. Gold fucking teeth. Tattooed up to the gills. Got bass on. I'm fucking sitting there. And I turn and look at him. And I'm like, this sucks. Right? All of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see this. And I turn and look. And the guy's like, yo. Like this. And he puts his hand like this. And I'm like, oh. So I turn the music down. And I'm like, what's up? And he's like, bro, I love that fucking song. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, all right, great. And I drove off, man. And this is something that, like, I was worried about forever, about what people thought about, right? Like this, this image, this fucking tough image of, you know, this fireman, this hard-ass dude that only listens to hardcore. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I just had a real human experience that I was so concerned about. And it ended completely different in this made-up scenario that I had running through my head this entire time. Dude, that's an awesome story, brother. I forget about where were we before that? I was we were on to... Cindy Lauper, I think, and you're no, 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 before Cindy Lauper. <laughs> no. Oh, you're uh, talking about suicidal ideations or whatever. Yeah, su- yeah we and, got from oh, suicide not, not to Cindy Lauper. I don't know how we made that God. transition. Very weird, but anyway, very organic, as they would say. Um, I'm not scared about talking about that anymore because, like, I, I don't. I'm not concerned with my image. I'm, um, I started living by this thing in my head. It's like, um. I'll, I, when I'm dead, I'll live in my past. Right now, I can't. I can only live in my past when I'm dead. Mm. So I'll save all that shit that I used to worry about back then. So I'm very open about my experiences because that's the only way growth is going to happen now. Um, so with me, it started off very mildly. Like I said, like that stupid fucking um, – first it was the um, the round, the 38 round. Um, and I like I honestly – like you start like playing these weird scenarios out in your head like while you're doing anything. Um, and it's just like a pity party, but you're just like, I wonder you start like, and I know this is going to fucking do not turn this off. I know people right now are just like, because it's getting too real. And this is what I used to do. When you start fucking sitting there, even as a joke in your head, thinking about like, who's going to be at your fucking funeral there, you're getting into that weird area. If you've already got issues in your head that you're not telling yourself that are going on, when you start doing that, they're going to start multiplying and they're going to. And it, it's there, it seems so innocent at first. And it's just like kind of like goofing off when you're thinking about them. And this could, fuck it, this could only happen to me. But that's exactly what happened. And I started thinking about this. And then I started thinking about where I was going to do it or how I was going to do it. And then, you know, like I told you, that fucking shell went from the counter or the round went from the counter into my pocket. And it was making noise in my pocket. And then all of a sudden that thing went into a gun. And it's crazy. You start romanticizing your death. And it's just, it's, fucking gross thinking about it now like it gives me like a weird like itchy feeling Ooh. um but it's a hundred percent and because you're in such this doom and gloom area and you're not trying to better yourself and i might be wrong and other people might do different and because i know people try and try and try and get out of depression but we need to try harder harder and do the work and consistently do the work because 
once it's in, it's in. There's always, if you end it early, there's there, you never have that chance of like that surprise in your head of clarity. And I got fucking beyond lucky that that happened to me because again, I had the incidents where, you know, like fucking seeing God and broken ribs and blood transfusions. I had that happen to me and it set me on a different course. And I needed a hard, like that just, I don't know, like it changed my mindset. And I, I only, I am only here because of someone else and right. from other people in my support group. And it, it's just, you have to, you have to keep going. It's, I know it's hard to say, but if any, reduce it to the fact, like if you were in a fire and you had to get out, you're not going to stop. And that's exactly where you are. And that's essentially what six feet over is all about, man. I was so fucking deep and down in that grave and I just kept climbing and climbing and climbing and I finally got out of it. Mm. So. Uh, question for dude it's solid dude it's solid message a uh, question from the audience nick edinger wants to know how do you feel that the resiliency you gained from being a firefighter played into your ability to fight and get onto the other side of your battle do you think as a group most firemen will be more or less likely able to tap into that strength to win the battle i think That's it definitely helped it 100 percent helped um especially because it was able to compare it to something more fucking switch that mindset the issue with us again is we fucking we're supermen and we we feel like we're these just powerful feelings that the normal everyday things don't happen to us and really it's just the first the initial aspect of it is admitting that we we are in that scenario because if we don't think we're in a fire we're not going to do the necessary things of self-rescue if we don't think that we're in imminent danger we're not going to do that sure it's we don't want to call that mayday right fucking ramirez the mayday mindset right obviously um it's you know, you've got the drags and everything else, but that self rescue, we need to, we need to sit there and take accountability. Okay. This shit's over my fucking head. I can't see anymore. I don't know what I'm doing. All right. Now I've got to, I've got to go into the self rescue protocol. I've got to go into this mandate protocol and I have to start working. And that's a, a perfect analogy for us firemen is we need to sit there and not be afraid to fucking call the mayday and then start doing the work because it's not easy. Once you do that, it's not like, okay, yeah, I'm fucking we're mayday, mayday, mayday. And all of a sudden everything's fine and these guys just grab you and you're fucking out. And, oh man, that was great. No, man, there's work to be done. And I think the resiliency that a firefighter has, if you implement that and that tenacity and that fucking go get it attitude into your recovery or just the, the simple acknowledgement of, hey man, I have a problem, 150% you're, you're dialed in. And I think I did kind of um, tip off of that a little bit, yeah. big time that that no like no you're you, you got to keep going we're not stopping here you, you got to keep going you got to keep going it just took me a long time to tap into that that i guess notion of getting into that mindset and it, again it's all a mindset and it's a light switch it's the exact same thing as like oh man you know like i should go run that mile or i have to go run that mile that's exact i need to be in shape so i have to go run that mile so get up and do it but you have to do it you can't just like think it into happening there's got to be action hmm. so no, it's powerful. It's powerful. Uh, Adam Melkai wants to know, how does your faith affect your resiliency in dealing with the darker emotions slash thoughts? So I'll tell you this. Um, one of the things that I don't really, really like bringing into this, um, because I know that a lot of the guys that I was, um, especially the um, some of the guys that were um, the veterans that I was in my treatment center were was faith. Sure. Um, and I, the reason that I don't like talking about it is because it's very off-putting. I've heard con consistently um, people that were in the 12 step program when they were dealing with AA is fuck AA. I don't want nothing to do with it because I'm not religious. Me personally, I think it had a lot to do with mine. Um, again, and uh, I, I, I had some, some weird moments, um, but definitely I think faith, anything that you put faith into. And if that's, if you hold God and you think that God holds you accountable for your actions, it's only going to make you stronger in your recovery. Um you've got to have faith in something, man. You've got to. And, um, and it's, I'll tell you, man, and if that's your go-to, it's an easy guy to lean on, man. He's, he's always listening. You're, you can always talk to him. You can always reach out to him. You can sit there and, but he, and he's going to tell you the exact same thing. You got to keep going. And um, I, I mean, I love the faithful aspect to it again. Um, recovery. If you don't believe in that, then, if you don't believe in, I guess, like a, a higher power, 
or anything like that, then believe in yourself, I guess, is the easiest way to do it. it but you need, you need, you have to believe in something. You got to draw faith or something. Hmm. For me, it was a higher power. I mean, it's going to change for everybody else, but I, I fucking leaned hard during that recovery and coming to, I mean, after the, the, uh, the transplant, um, the recovery, like, I mean, I was up the next day and, um, I was walking as soon as I, as soon as I got out of the hospital, I was walking. Um, and I just kept pushing. I kept pushing, you know, give me strength. You know, it, I'm in better shape now than I was before any of this all happened. And nice. I can hundred percent attribute a lot of that to faith. Which leads right into this question, which was, comes from Kevin Whitaker. Maddie, what type of things are you doing to make sure you get back on the job after such a long journey? And are you scared to come back to the job? This is a good question. Um, physically, um, there are some limitations that I've got right now, only because there was thousands of eternal stitches after the uh, the um, the procedure. Um, but I'm doing exactly. I'm following the guidelines of what my doctor says. Like again, like I'm not too many core exercise, but like specific muscle groups I'm allowed to do. So obviously, there's a physical component to it. And again, that I don't want to ever come back to fucking work if I'm that liability aspect. If I can't physically do this job. Um, that I'm not going to. If I can't, and that's another thing that we don't think about. If I can't mentally do this job, I shouldn't be on the fucking truck either. Mm, These are all no. things that need to be accountable for. It's not those 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 muscles are great, man. But if that this fucking thousand dollar lid you're wearing isn't protecting a fucking mind that's making correct decisions or is thinking great, it's fucking useless. Every every skill set you have, every um, thing that you're physically capable of doing, if you're not mindful and mentally in the game as much as your fucking physical prowess it's useless it's useless um so again i've been doing the mental work obviously speaking with a psychiatrist i got really really into fucking going outside um and i know this is gonna sound super cliche i guess but fucking ice baths man um i'm not into the uh the sunning my butt yet i guess that's like a thing that people are doing now but the uh definitely doing the ice baths are, uh, have been a huge help. Um, the ice baths, physical activity, and then definitely staying on top of that mind game. I've come to the point in my life where I've realized since I've been sad for a long time that I feel like I'm always going to have that reluctancy to be sad. But that's why I have to keep continuing to do the work and do the things that keep me from getting into that place again and falling right. feet under. Um, but it's great now because I'm excited about doing it. Like I was never fucking excited about waking up and going walking or putting the ruck on and you know the rucksack on and going for ruck that never like occurred to me like i was just like if it wasn't training that had to do with the fire service i didn't want to do really physical <laughs> anything uh, i love dude, you give me so many sound bites so far like i write down every time i like oh i love this sound bite i love this sound bite i'm like how many f bombs can i fit into one <sighs> sound bite i'm going for the record here apparently not it's not a knock it's not a knock i'm just like I know I've almost got a mouth like someone I think that you were up in uh is it Iowa or Idaho with? Was it Eckerson or uh Oh yeah, yeah. I know <laughs> Bobby. Yeah, hey. yeah. Bobby Eggert? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean I'm in the running. That's you all give him a, you give him a run for his money, brother. Hey, there's a <laughs> lot there's a lot worse company to be in, I promise you that. So I love that. Uh, I love that dude. One hundred percent. Do you know what's you know this is something that's crazy that we were talking about physical fitness? Uh how some people, and I, I guess I was like one of the people that was like this, that, you know, like if you were to put me in a fucking gym and you had, had me lift a whole bunch of weights or, you know, like sit there and go for a, a 10 mile round or do any of these things, I would be shit at it. Horrible. And like, you know, like there's guys on the job that look like shit and all of a sudden you put them to work in a fire and these guys are fucking Olympic athletes. I've never right. understood how that's possible. I, I understand what you're saying. It's crazy. I was going to reference uh, one of my chiefs right now, but no, I'll say it like uh, chief Mike Salzano doesn't look like much, but that guy's one of the hardest working best firemen I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh, I love that. I love that. Uh, <laughs> shameless plug June 12th, Mike Salzano will be on the scrap addressing uh, Matty Johnson, that comment, Matty Johnson slam on his physical fitness. No, 100%. Uh, no, I know what you're saying. Exactly. And, I don't have a good answer for it. I always said, you know, because you hear that, you know, he, the guy smokes two packs a day, but he can outwork anybody on an air pack, you know? It's, and it's crazy. Like, um, what are your thoughts on the, this comes from James Michelisco. He said, what are your thoughts on the four pillars of resiliency? Mental, physical, social, and spiritual. 
I teach our recruits that these are important to maintain during tough times to stay resilient and functioning. Your thoughts? 100%. You can't, this isn't, we do not work in an area where you can be partially good at any of those. You, it's, it's, a, it's a combination package. It's just like anything. You, one does not work without the other at all in this profession. And that's another thing is we don't, you, we work in a profession, you can't be 90% good at it, 99% good at it. We run too many calls. We work too many serious incidents that you've got to be dialed in with all those. And especially, um, that's another thing. That's an amazing analogy, especially getting driven in at a young age in a recruit class and carrying that with you throughout your entire career. I mean, how could you go wrong in your career if you stuck to those four things? A hundred percent. No, I love it. I love the answer. And you can give a hundred percent into all four of them. So, I mean, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, and I'm just now realizing, and because like I said, for so long, I was lacking in, I mean, the majority, (laughs) I I was really good at one of the four at one point in my life. And now I'm finally, you know, starting to, to really pick up on the other ones. Um, Again, like it took me suffering um, what I did with the self-inflicted pain that I, that I did um, to really get my faith back. And then the getting my faith back helped me become resilient and my mental aspect, and then moving on to um, me being so excited about being able and allowed to go walk. After all of this, and this is, uh, I hope this, when you're deep and you're down and you're down in that fucking hole, everything, and I just to, to give you like a, I guess like an image, imagine I was always wearing fucking sunglasses, everything, everything in my life I had sunglasses on, whether it was light out, whether it was dark out, I always had fucking sunglasses on. After I made this journey, I swear to God, it's like the glasses came off. I'm seeing colors I've never seen before. I'm experiencing emotion I've never had before. All of these things progressively got better because I worked my ass off. I tried to be happy, and those four things became abundant in my life, and everything has gotten better. Dude, I love the message. I love the message, man. And uh, uh, Again, Matty is only speaking from his personal experience. But damn, I think it's valuable to the fire service. Yes. Yeah, it's it's, it's needed. It. No, dude, without a doubt. And no, I mean, people, there's a ton of people. So I don't want to downplay like people aren't talking about it, but it needs a spotlight shown on it in the same way that hose handling, fire streams, smoke reading, uh, building construction. It needs the exact same amount of, of, of focus put on mental health for our brothers and sisters out there, if we truly want to say that we care about each other, it needs the same amount of focus. Um, definitely. And again, then that just, it gets back into the, um, this is, you've got to have that, that lid's got to protect a, um, uh, a solid mind and you got to work on it. And what's crazy is when things in your life are lacking, when we get back into faith and relationships. And one thing that um, I guess correlates with all of those things is family. Family is such a big aspect or a big, part of the fire service and they i i don't want to say it doesn't get talked about enough because they do and everyone loves their families and everyone loves their wives and their husbands that are at home but we take for granted a lot of the time and danny moran and me had like talked in length about this about the fact that we're on shift and we talk a lot about the camaraderie and the brotherhood with um our, our firemen and it's amazing and it really does just it sets us apart from pretty much every career path that you could ever be on but that third of the time that we're gone our families are home by themselves, mm-hmm. taking care mm-hmm. of the kids, doing these things, missing us. They spend a third of their lives that they they took those vows and stuff to um, to be with us that we're not around for, and they're doing a lot of the brunt work. And they, we really need to remember that and make sure that our home life is just as solid, even more actually more solid than our work life is. And um, uh, again, I'm learning learning that more and more now because I, wow. I really. Dude, that's right, right in the heart. One of one of my biggest mantras and the drum I'll beat until I'm retired and they put me in the ground is there. You know, people talk about work life balance in this job. There's no work life balance. There's no, no. It is family first. Period. Period. Do not let this job replace what is most important ever. It will do it. It'll do it in a heartbeat. It's done it a million times. It's done it way before you took this job. It'll do it long after you're gone. There is no such thing as balance. Put your family first, period. 100%. And again, and then besides all that, and you you feel this, and I know you do, and I, I, 
um, Amanda, God bless her soul. You're traveling all the time. Yes, dude. And, and it's, and 100%. Those, it's not, and it's, and then again, it's not just work. It's every training event that we go to. And again, we, it's easy. We always sit there and say, and I, I remember I used to say this all the time. Well, I'm training for a job that could kill me, but I'm also hanging out with the boys and I'm going and having fun. And those yes. are my boys weekends and stuff like that. Um, but again, just, um, yeah, family's got to be number one. In Don't whole lose sight of, of what is most important. Do not, do not let it. I promise you, if you keep them first, they will let you run and gun with the boys. If you keep them and first. it makes work a lot easier, man. No doubt. No doubt. Definitely. Uh, man, yes, family is forever. I love asking the question about books. I don't know. I don't know how much of a reader you are because we haven't had a ton mm -hmm. of conversations about books. But it seems like you're a very introspective person, so I'm excited for this question. Book or books that you think firefighters should be reading? So I've been like I've been down like a uh, firefighters. Um, uh, the nine, <laughs> the nine else. Um, obviously your book, Corley. Um, <laughs> yes, that's a mandatory now. No. The nine else. Um, you can skip that. You know, what's funny is like, I stopped what's crazy and I don't know if this is going to make any sense. I stopped, like I, I was reading really heavy and then I stopped reading because I was like, you know what? I'm in a great mindset. You know, I need to start, um, studying like promotion testing. And like, since I've been off for a long time, I was like, you know what? I'm really going to hit the books. And what's crazy is like, I had like a, I guess like a moment where I was like, dude, we're not done working on you yet. And so like, cause I still, I don't want to go back to work and then sit there and worry about sitting for a lieutenant's test and, and all that stuff. I need to, you know, I've got a, and this is a crazy thing is like, um, it's a little off topic, but you know, I've got a lot of, you know, headaches that I've got to atone for when it comes to coming back to work. Um, you know, I let a lot of people down and, um, it's very easy, super fucking easy for people, especially in my state to sit and be like, you know what? Fuck everybody. They weren't there for me. You know, yeah, you know, fuck them. You know, I only care about the people that were sitting there and, and suffered with me through this. The one thing that I can say about that is that I'm blessed and beyond grateful for the people that stuck with me through this entire nasty scenario. The ones that fell off, I completely understand why they did. And I can't be upset for them not wanting me to be a part of their life when I was, I did not give them a reason to stick around. Mm. And that is something that you really got to take ownership because it's very, very easy to sit there and motherfuck all these people that decided to take us the back seat when you were killing yourself, dying, being shitty, being a shitty person at home, being a shitty person at work. I would have not wanted to be around me for the people that stuck around. You're amazing. I don't know why you did. And I'm fucking thankful every day. It, but for the other people that didn't and i didn't want to miss this that's why i brought this up no i completely understand i wasn't i wasn't worth it i was not worth it and i'm slowly slowly getting better to that and that's one reason why i didn't i stopped i put the promotional books down and i started reading again um <laughs> but i wanted to get to that because no, I no, feel brother, like hey I, let, me, let me just throw the caveat out if there's any message you want to get out do not let me stomp on it by talking about books no no no, no i just like so, that uh, one hundred percent, man. I I, I wasn't uh, even I wasn't even um, thinking about talking about that, but it's really important to me because, um, and it, this happens with a lot of my friends too. That'll be like, "Oh, fuck these people," blah blah, and you know, I I didn't I didn't give anybody a reason to stick around. Um, another, this is I, I guess this plays off of this a little bit, but with the book that I'm reading that uh, that I'm reading right now, or uh, I'm rereading right now, um, uh, I'm reading uh, Seneca. Um, Seneca's book is just amazing. Um, I've been really into philosophy lately. And the other one is um, Tribe, and it's about you know um, military guys coming back after Younger, war. Yeah, Tribe it's, it's, is it's, awesome, and 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 Seneca's awesome. Good, good lord, uh, two. Yeah, so I've been, I've I been love really, the Stoics, and and I love yeah. Go yeah, ahead. I've been there, there's so it's what's crazy about the Stoicism and everything that I've been getting into lately. It's a lot of it's a lot of growth for me at least, and I really vibe with it. But it's fucking crazy that someone that was around so long ago is dealing with the same problems that I'm going through right now. It's crazy. And it really, it's humans are humans. Doesn't matter when they were from, but, uh, uh, fuck, I got sidetracked. This is the problem with tension deficit disorder. Um, I was talking about, uh, people and, uh, like giving up on me and, you know, um, uh, putting in the work. Um, 
yeah, I actually don't know where we are. It's easier just to be like, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to Theo Vaughn this and just be like, yeah, I don't even know what we're talking about. No, 100%, dude. The, the accountability towards your own actions and people's reaction to your actions and your absolution of them in that, brother, it was powerful. It was great. Thank you. So. Oh, um, the other thing. Books. So this is interesting, especially <laughs> with FDIC coming up, and I'm going to plug FDIC. Hit it. Um, so we're definitely um, – I'm going to FDIC this year for the first time, and it's amazing. That's I mean, awesome. it kind of sucked because I was – I actually wasn't going to go to FDIC, and I was kind of happy about it because I was supposed to be back at work earlier and then, you know, the doctor. But, I mean, I've got to trust their their process and their program. I had a significant surgery, and um, they don't want me to, like, fall back on anything. But anyway, I'm heading to FDIC, and um, I wanted to talk about – because I'm going to – Obviously, I'm part of the Fools and, you know, with the Fools Toast and everything. And I'm getting to go to the uh, the Brotherhood Bash. Nice. And I think this needs to be discussed. And this is – it is really, really, really fucking easy to say the Brotherhood is dead. But I'm going to come out with a statement right now that I hope resonates with everybody who's listening to this. I hope you never, ever, ever have to find out that the Brotherhood is real. Because when this all happened to me, the and it didn't happen to me. What I put everyone through, the fam, my family, my lo- like loved ones, my friends, the guys at work, my department, the outpour of people that I have never met in my entire life from the fire service and from the military was insane. My mother was getting phone calls. We were getting food. Um, the GoFundMe that happened. I was in the toughest spot that I think that any, I put myself in the toughest spot and my family in a, a horrible spot. And it it's sickening to think that people think that the brotherhood's gone or it's it's changed or it's different mm. because it's not. I mean, I feel like when you think about who you consider your flock or your people, inside the fire service and especially this is this goes to the guys that are listening to this because you guys are the one percent no one fucking sits at home and puts on a podcast let alone a fire department podcast but if you guys are sitting here listening to a fireman talk about mental health and you guys are in it yeah um special you're a special breed you you guys are a fucking you're better than me because if i didn't go through any of this shit i would have been like man i fucking love Corey, but i'm not i'm poorly i'm not listening to this shit i promise you they're not much if they're if right now man they're they're tuned in so go ahead and um it's when you think about your flock and the people that you're with and the people that you hold in your circle and that brotherhood, a lot of them aren't on your department, but they're the guys that, you know, you train with that have that, those similar in, things with, and you know that they're always going to be there for you. But I promise you, I got phone calls, cards, you know, challenge coins, checking on my mother food from people I have never, ever met in my entire life because we either work in the same profession or their son works in the same profession, or they had a friend that heard about what was going on. And that fire department hashtag, that badge that we all carry and we all call today, had people reach out that no one, I don't give a fuck if you were an accountant for the biggest accounting firm, that you would not have gotten the same response. Mm. So tread very, very lightly about that. And with mental health, it's very easy to say the brotherhood's dead because when you do that, you completely eliminate the fact that you can go to them for help, mm. that you can tap into that. Because when you're like, oh, the brotherhood's dead, I'm not going to go sit there and tell these fucking people that, you know, my stories, they don't give a fuck about me. That shit's dead. That's old school. Well, you're cutting off that lifeline. It's very, very easy to do that. And I made that fucking mistake. I was that same guy that was fucking bringing morale down shitting on the fire department because i was in such a fucking bad mood with myself that it was easy to make everyone else try to feel sad and try to shift the attention from me being bad onto other people the brotherhood is fucking alive and well and i will fucking say that and preach it and if you're having an issue with people at your department then be the fucking change in your department but stop shitting on people that are fucking trying to do good and fucking setting up training events and doing all these things, oh, fuck, training. It's not even a real fire. Fuck you. That's what I have to say about Brotherhood haters. And I hope I made that very clear because I'm passionate about that. And they were fucking there for me throughout my entire struggle, and they're still there. So. Hold on. I got to timestamp. I got to timestamp this. 
<laughs> you give me so much to work with as far as a sound bite. Uh, I, I really want to use that one right there. I, I think it is 100%. Okay, uh, discombobulated 100%. Uh, we have a thing we do on the scrap. It is the five questions for firefighters. After we did 120 episodes of it, we switched it up and made it the next five questions for firefighters. We're on the tail end. We're about to do the next next. But right now, it's the still, next next. I don't, we're working on it. Might, it might be the uh, 5Q3. So that way we can do 5Q4, whatever. But not the point. <laughs> um, next five questions for firefighters. Answers are 100% your opinion. There's no right okay. or wrong. The points are arbitrary. They're assigned by me with the help of the audience. Excuse me. So my question for you first is, Maddie Johnson, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? I am. Here we go. I was, I was, uh, I was reborn ready. Reborn ready. What single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and a top-tier go-to badass firefighter? Mm -hmm. This is a toss-up for me because I want to give two answers. Um, I'd say accountability. 100% um, because it, it pretty much factors in a lot of the things that I think are very, very important. If you're accountable for your own actions, it's going to strive. It's going to like, I guess um, you're going to admit when you're wrong, you're going to be dialed in about it. You're going to grow as a person. Um, when you're accountable of your actions, it's going to, it forces, um, I guess, empathy, um, compassion. I don't know. I really like people that are able to admit, their flaws because it's hard to get good at this fucking job and the only way that we can get better at it is understanding that we're flawed in something and then putting in the fucking hard work to do better mm. here's what i love about the answer is it ties right back into what you were just talking about about uh when you said there were people out there who 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 weren't there for you but you said but it was my fault of course you know what I'm saying? That, that, but what I'm saying is the genuine like accountability. When you say accountability, I feel it from my soul. That's why I give you max points for that answer, because you owned every bit of that, and that grace is, is something that only comes from, uh, man, what you've been through. Number two, if you could go back in time, and give yourself, I'm not sure. This might be the most. Uh, intrigued i've ever been on asking this question i mean i'll be honest with you if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie what would it be rookie matt john oh man all right um i think this is going to be a weird answer i don't know if this has ever been said but enjoy every position that you have in the fire service as much as possible and the reason i say that is um i know like a lot of the guys or anybody who's listening if there's anybody left um that we ride ambulances um when you first get on and um especially in south florida we, you you have to pay your dues you ride on the box but we still catch fires and stuff with it you you're still working on the fire um When you when you bunch of older chiefs and I'm gonna speak this, and we're all sitting around uh, the table. Let's say it's late night. Big thing is um, on shifts. I love getting old. P I love getting pizza at like twelve thirty, one in the morning. And everybody, <laughs> it's crazy. The battalions, everybody will show up at our station. And everybody sits there, and it's the best time. Everyone's talking shit and just really getting deep. And, you know, obviously doing the firefighter gossip, and it's just great. It's such a fucking awesome time. Right. But what's interesting about this, and I just started thinking about this now, is when you get all these old guys together, do you know what they talk about? They'll sit across from each other and they're like, hey, man, do you remember when me and you used to ride rescue together when mm. we were young? And it's just, you see their faces light up. Obviously, they, and they, when they'll, you get a story about them and obviously they like catching fires since they moved into the engine company and moved on to a truck company and a battalion. You know, you've got those. But it's so awesome to see these older guys fucking light up about, their beginnings when they're first on the department and just like the hijinks and the, 
the fucking around at work and the <laughs> badass calls and just the insanity <laughs> and how like amazing just watching them re- relive these instances and their stories and their tone of voice and the laughs it's so genuine so i think that enjoy regardless if you're getting your ass kicked in a, a shitty engine or you're on a, a bad ambulance and you're moving your way up just really just uh, immerse yourself in all the experiences you have in your different position because if you're doing this right you're going to sit there and you're going to make those moves you're going to ru- that that boot fireman to lieutenant to captain to battalion and you're going to keep that going and you're going to leave the seat for the next person that's coming on after you two for two absolute max points especially especially when you tied in the story uh i love it number three what is your favorite training drill uh favorite training drill oh i'm gonna say now um i love um becoming or uh competent with writ training because it's so important um it's i think it's it's hard and it's hard to become um i guess um coherent or actually like even any any type of way good at it it's hard to master and the guys that are on the red competition teams um that are coming out and doing like the trainings and stuff especially with our department are so perfect and methodical and like their movements and stuff and it's um our department again and i'm gonna i'm gonna sit there and i'm gonna keep talking up my department because they've just they've been amazing the training bureau has just been awesome and they're it's just it's a great the great drills we're doing night drills we're getting done with dinner and we're out there in front of here for two hours at night and we're sitting there and we're just ripping through it and um i love it it's an aggressive training exercises um and they start from the ground up i love the fact that you can i obviously do this with other skills but we're going to do this with no gloves on and our normal clothes we're going to get comfortable with the equipment then we're going to put gloves on then we're going to put our coats on then we're going to get all of our gear on then we're going to go on air then we're going to black out and then we're going to build ourselves up and we're going to sit there and i built this drill to the point where we have a win at the end of it wow so that we're confident and I've, they've just done an amazing job. And I fucking, I, I can't say enough about uh, the guys that have come out and done rig training. I, hey, uh, amazing answer, first of all, um, with the explanation. But the way you, uh, again, gave away all credit to everybody else. To, the way they make it so great, so make it so great. And But no, max points, 100% uh, on number three. Number four, what mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? Taking this job for granted. When I, again, when my, uh, when I was sad and my mental health wasn't the best, I hated this job. I hated coming to work. I hated everything about it. And um, I'll tell you something, the shittiest times get, and as, as hard as some of like going on these like obnoxious calls, and you know the schedule and the not sleep um and i'm not saying that there's a life outside the fire department because there definitely is but while you're able to do it and you can when you can't it's a blow man and i can 100 percent understand how these retirees get sad after the job you miss the camaraderie you miss the kitchen table talks i'm you miss those late night pizzas you miss the fires you miss the wash down afterwards you miss that just like getting off shift and going to have breakfast. You miss, you miss putting your gear on. You miss bitching about fucking doing laundry. It's, we have an amazing job. We have amazing mm. partners. We have amazing friends on the department. It, we get to, in, in essence, when you think of this as like a little kid thing, um, and this was funny because, you know, um, my uh, pseudo uncle growing up as a fireman and uh, my dad was a cop. When we had this conversation. They talked about how, what would what would you rather do? And um, my when he explained it, the fireman he he said, "Well, listen, man, do you like sleepovers with your best friends?" I said, "Of course I do." He's like, "You like riding around in those big red trucks?" Yeah, you love fire, right? I said, "Of course." You like watching movies and sitting down in a chair and talking with your buddies and having dinner with your buddies and all the time and having dessert with your buddies and then going out on adventures all day, all night, and then getting off and then you have a little bit of a break and you get to sleep a little bit and you go back and you do it again for thirty years. Oh my God. And I was sold. And uh, what, was funny was, what was funny was my father asked, looked at me and goes, yeah, you should probably be a fireman. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so definitely taking this job for granted because it is, it's amazing. Every, I mean, everything. And again, I might 
um, be speaking from a different point only because I fucking absorbed so much of the good parts of it. Right. Along with the, and so yeah, don't ever, 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 because there's always another guy that is fucking hundred percent willing to get your spot. So cool. don't take it for granted. Dude, that's a, that's a powerful, powerful message, man. Powerful message. I always say, if you're not enjoying this job, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I, I love that thing about explaining it to a kid about, you want to hang with your buddies? <laughs> you wanna, yeah. Dude, that is so good, man. I've never heard that. I love it. Uh, max great. points, four for four. Final question. Same as always. It is, it is heavy fire. Oh, Search, here it is. Searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? I'm going to answer this question. And I caught a lot of shit after answering it this way too. Everyone started making fun of me, but but I got to stick with it. I'm all about it. I am a, uh, I am an, I am a truckie in an ambulance guy's body. So I am a hundred percent going to be searching and getting it. I love it. And when that engine company comes in, I'm going to sit there and hide in a closet like a cat. So that's it, man. I'm I'm going in. (laughs) I want the grab. I want the I grab. So grab is always yeah. my grab. Grab is my personal. And, and honestly, to be one hundred percent honest, I would I would completely lie on this anyway because, like, obviously, Rob is such a, a truck guy at heart, and I just love making that man happy. So I'm gonna I'm gonna for the for the mayday mindset sake, I'm always gonna answer truck. Just for macho. Absolutely. Win for the truck. Max points, all the points, max, max points. Brother, you just crushed the five, the next five questions for firefighters. And I don't even feel like I was soft on you. Sometimes, sometimes people accuse me of being soft on the guests. I really feel like you crushed those. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. All right. Maddie is awesome. That officially makes it 189 scraps in the books. My friend, Maddie Johnson, what an amazing evening. First of all, if someone wants to get a hold of you, reach out to you. Uh, how can they go about doing that? Um, Instagram or Facebook, but real quick, real quick. And this okay. is a really neat, it's a quick story. And I hate it. But anyway, cause I forgot to talk about this. No, no, go, My dad go. was a um, first lieutenant in the infantry in Vietnam in 1969. And, um, we were going through some old shit the other day and we ended up finding his helmet and on his helmet, I thought it was super cool. He had like insect repellent and all this shit. It was old Love and this. fucked up, but he had, um, so Avis did a, um, I guess like a, a thing where they had these buttons and I think in it. It was so fucking cool. And I ended up putting the, the button on my lid. But so Avis, the car rental place, and right. I loved it. I guess it was like a motto from their company or whatever. But um, I loved it. And it says, uh, we try harder. And I thought this was so amazing. And it worked so well with the fire service because we need to always fucking try harder, whether it's training, whether it's getting our uh, our body in shape, whether it's getting our mind in shape. We always need to try harder for them and for ourselves. So it's just, I love that. And um, yeah, so that so that came from wear, that came from that came from Dad's helmet in yeah. 1969. Yep, nice, nice, love it. So I thought that was pretty neat. Okay, Instagram, Facebook, the best place to reach you. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, actually, um, six feet over is going to be happening soon. Um, definitely, I've got some shirts and shit um starting to come out. Nice. Um, hopefully, going to be doing some talking things, and then eventually, I know you fire department people are going to hate this. But I eventually want to start getting a, uh, a mental health, um, possibly podcast, maybe. I don't know. We're still in the works. We've got some other people that are talking about it. Um, but it's going to be music and other things. I'm going to sneak some fucking um, some head shrinking stuff in there. Good. So uh should be good. Brother, I, I mental health is a huge, huge um, passion of mine. And so let me know if I can do anything to help at all uh-huh. as it gets going. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there we go. Housekeeping. Go to firehousevigilance.com. The vigilantes go join five bucks a month. It's less than a Starbucks coffee and you can sign up. You can do it for a year at a time. If you like subscriptions, if you don't like subscriptions, uh, I am off to Indianapolis and I will see Maddie Johnson there this week, uh, for FDIC. I hope to see all of you there where there's a, uh, a vigilantes meetup on Thursday evening. If you're a vigilante, you know where it's at. You know we're going to meet up. We're, you know we're going to hang out. It's a, uh, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, I teach Thursday morning. Please don't let my class be empty. I teach right after Brian Brush kills it, absolutely comes and crushes it on Thursday morning. 
on the big stage. And so after that, come be there. Please don't let my room be empty. Uh, meet up, Vigilante meet up that evening. So Vigilantes be ready for it. This is the first one we've really tried to put some uh, actual, what do you call, structure and planning behind. We're going to make it happen even better in the future. Uh, and that's just another bonus besides the exclusive swag and all the other stuff for being a Vigilante. Uh, the scraps and the killer lineup of 2023 continues. Matty Johnson crushed it tonight. Next week, fresh off of FDIC, Mike Turpak. Holy crap, I love that dude. Then it's Christopher Nam. Never had him on before. We're going to talk building construction, followed by Bob Pressler. Man, 2023 is, is really going to be spicy. Uh, my brother. Okay. Uh, there was a couple questions I ignored as it went through because they asked about this. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, not far, a problem. As far as the toast goes, but people asked if they could hear you say the toast. So, one thing I always close the scrap the exact same way. In fact, in 100, uh, I think. Yeah, 189 scraps. I've never not closed the scrap with my deal. And tonight, we're going to not close the scrap with my deal. And you're going to close it with the toast if you are willing to do so. I'm honored. I'm honored. Brother, let's do this. All right. We'll give um, real quick before I give the toast. Don't let anybody tell you you can't toast with water. Number one. Fuck them if they do. Anyway, big shout out to Liquid Death as well. Um, so here we go. In the grips of death, we depend on our brothers. Through smoke and fire, we protect each other. Our calling is clear and we shall not wander. We're protecting life. It's death before dishonor. And here and now we raise our glass, a toast to the fallen heroes of the past. Tradition, brotherhood, duty forever. For this could be our last drink together. Cheers, guys. Sláinte.